Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're going to consider today uh, the foundations of, uh, well, the foundation upon which the J-curve is set, which is justification by faith. And we looked at this previously back in chapter 4, but we're coming at a slightly different angle today. There is great joy in the thing we'll talk about today. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss any of it. Um, This is what allows us this justification, your death, burial, resurrection, ascension. Uh, The fact that these things are real and solid, precisely why a Christian can experience joy, can even think about embracing suffering and even rejoicing in it. So would you visit us here today? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you give us more than just intellectual construction here, but would you would you change us? We long to be changed to become more like Jesus. It's in his sweet name we pray. Amen. I'd like to start this morning. Peter's going to read a quote from C.S. Lewis. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first... Perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in such a way that hurts abominably and does, and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Let let that just sink down for a minute. Make that trip from head to heart. While we open with our typical questions. How are the things we're discussing and learning changing the way you're thinking and living? Has being in Christ enabled you to edit yourself in recent weeks instead of becoming touchy or defensive? I mean, there's a lot of kinds of questions that we could be asking. Uh, talk to us. How's this, how's this settling on your life? Is it changing the way you think? Is it changing the way you actually behave? I know this is always a cold kickstart in the morning. <laughs> Walking in here saying, just, you know, feed me, and we'll get there. Question number two, the answer is definitely yes. Instead of becoming touchy and defensive. I don't have any specific <laughs> examples, but the word j curve is going through my head in certain circumstances when I get annoyed at someone. Of feeling justified, kind of just let it pass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. The thought comes to mind that it's more of a uh, instead of a fighting and resisting, it's more of a joining and resting. Yeah. Like if if you're not sure what's going on, then you'll fight it and resist it, and kind of like a like when your alignment's off, you know, you kind of. Er- but when you realize, oh, I see, this could be a J card moment, then it's a joining and participating rather than fighting. Yeah. And I love that, you know, the quote from C.S. Lewis is so apt because you start realizing, well, he's building a courtyard here, or he's putting up a tower here. Wow. Okay, if, 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 if that's what's going on, I can actually embrace this. I can actually say... Okay, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I'm being changed. The house is being furnished to be a castle instead of a fine little cottage. Um, Good, good stuff. All right. Well, in chapter 4, we talked at some length about the foundation for the J-curve, which is justification by faith. He's going to revisit that. So if some of what what you read this week felt familiar to you, it's because it should be. 
Uh, but he's coming at a slightly different angle, and he's talking about the concept of, suppose for a moment that that foundation is kicked out from underneath the J-curve. What does that look like? What are the consequences of that? And so uh, that's where we are today. So if you'd be on page 71, there's a quote there. My pride and will were caught. He's talking about himself. Paul Miller's talking about himself. My pride and will were constantly exposed and stripped. He's talking about a time when the Lord was just tearing them down, kicking out walls, putting up towers, building courtyards. During this time, I got to know God like never before. He took away everything I loved in ministry and gifted me with his enduring presence. What are the common ways we tend to respond when we're living with this kind of exposure? So think about what this is like. We're being, you know, the Lord takes us through seasons like this, doesn't he? Where he's stripping us down, where he's exposing things in us that are ugly. Um, in our, let me ask the question a slightly different way. How do we tend to respond to that if we're living out of the power of the flesh? Anger. Yeah, we get angry, don't we? Indignant. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a, how exactly do I want to phrase this, a, a dangerous and incorrect way to respond that looks a lot like union with Christ and trying to embrace that, but is actually a little bit more superstitious, and it's the perspective that's, that tries to understand or pretends to know, this is what God is teaching me, and if I learn this lesson, then God will take the trial away. Right? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can only learn the patience God is trying to teach me, then my marriage will be back together. And it's not quite so tidy that way. No, it's and not. I, I think there's a danger. That's how I like that word. <laughs> there's definitely not a danger tidy. of trying to understand all of God's purposes and saying, if I do this, then God will, will fix this. I just have to learn the particular lesson here, and then we'll be set. We kind of go into deal-making mode, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's, laughs> okay, Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's great Yeah, that's very insightful. I think, you know, we don't we tend, again, we talked about the two economies last week. We deal in get me out of pain. God deals in I want to keep you in a place where you're becoming completely dependent upon me. And there's two dynamics. Um, and, and, and we're constantly moving toward, I, I, I got to defend myself. I got to get out of this. I got to, this, it hurts too badly. And I need to get out of this discomfort. And so we self-protect. Uh, Paul Miller describes the enduring, and, and we do need to camp out on this because I think it'd be really easy to skip over that phrase in the sentence we just read. He describes the enduring presence of the Lord as a gift. What is he talking about? What is this enduring presence and what are the things, uh, what kinds of things does it bring with it? I don't think I wrote that correct. What is the enduring presence that he's talking about? I got that picture again of the child clinging to the parent, arms and legs wrapped. He is like, he needs Christ every day, in every moment. He is with him, in him. He's talking to him, communicating. And it's a participation, like they're going together instead of fighting, resisting, separation. It's like a it's a woven fabric, um, and you don't get there unless you've been broken, because you still have some of you left, right? But he had to be empty before he could really experience that enduring presence. Dependence comes to mind, that word. Mm -hmm. Probably the only thing that's left that will help. Mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But here's a challenge, right? Because we're going to read about Mother Teresa. We're, we're looking at Luther and Mother Teresa in this chapter, and he's talk, you know, he talks later on in this chapter about Mother Teresa not sensing God's nearness, can't feel Him near. Which I love the analogy of child and parent. I think it's very accurate. The challenge is that child can feel mommy or daddy's arms wrapped around, right? Sometimes. And we know this. I mean, you read through the Psalms and you read David consistently saying, 
How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? What's David saying? I, I, I just, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? So it's it's we have to be careful when we're talking about what what is this enduring presence? Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't feel it. So what is it when we don't feel it? What is that enduring presence when we don't feel it? What are you going to do with that? I don't sense God's near to me. In fact, he seems, heaven seems silent. I feel like there's this like metal cover over my life and my prayers make it as far as the ceiling. What's that enduring presence in those? Because I think all of us are probably old enough here to have experienced a few seasons like that. Heaven's silent. <coughs> what is that enduring presence? I do remember a time, um, you know, Jeremy hadn't been gone for even a year yet, <laughs> and I was just really struggling. And, um, you know, I was crying. And I said, I know you're there, I know you're here, but you can't hold me physically, you know. I can't do this. And, I mean, he was very gracious to me. But, yeah, I was like, I know you're here, but I miss Jimmy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anybody can quite ante up to a widow. <laughs> you know, uh, in in experiencing that aloneness, um, and what do we? I mean, what do we do? We we keep moving forward. Faith is that thing that says, "Today I don't feel you, but I'm going to move forward based on what I know to be true. I belong to you." <clears throat> And I'm going to live like I belong to you. And the choices I make are going to reflect I belong to you. It's not me holding on to you. And here's a, a little bit where the analogy breaks down. It's not, it's not me holding on to him. Mm -hmm. He's holding me in that strong, powerful hand of his and saying, I got you. Mm -hmm. And we start living like we actually believe that. And that's where faith becomes, and we're going to talk a lot about this today, that's where faith is the thing that actually becomes faith. Faith is being sure, certain of the things that we do not see. And I would add to that, faith is being sure of the things that we do not feel. See, actual nature of faith is, if you saw it, it wouldn't be faith. If you had strong affection and feeling undergirding you, and we love it when our lives are that way, but it's not always that way. Faith wouldn't be exercised like it is when feeling is stripped away. So it's based on what we know. When we're, when we're, that, this is why we're camping out on this idea of what is this enduring presence. It, it's not always something, because I think it can easily, we, we tend to think, what's well, when I'm, I, I'm feeling God is close, and we know what that's like. But it's not always there. Mm -hmm. I find myself thinking, Matt, of the uh, a, a kind of a, a, a imagery analogies with children again. You know, the child, a very young child, always wants mom or dad's presence, usually mom. Um, and bedtime comes, and you have to put the child to bed. And part of the part of the aim is that this child can know that I'm present, even when. You don't feel me present. You, walk out you know, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So there's something about growing up for us too that can't be dependent on the immediate feelings all the time. Yeah. 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 And there's strength as we get weaned. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Huh. Yeah. 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 Now this is a pack, but I'm the obvious. Okay. Deeply. 
Her love deepened her faith. Love created faith. But only as we enter but the way he said that love created faith, it seems to me saying it like that, he's taking the shape her off the foundation of faith. I think I would prefer I felt more comfortable would have said that you know, the J-curve or the, the love enhances the, the, our faith mm-hmm. or enriches it or complements our faith. <laughs> but faith is the first thing. He said that earlier. And so it almost sounds to me, it feels like he's taking it off the foundation, the J-curve off the found, very foundation of justification by faith. Well, I think that's the point, Pat, is he's, he's going to show us throughout the chapter that Mother Teresa really struggled with the doctrine of justification by faith. And I think what he's trying to do here is he's trying to accurately portray how Mother Teresa would describe her own walk with the Lord. I don't think, I don't think he's trying to say she was right. Though, though he does describe himself that way, too. You know, in the next paragraph, one of his most enduring experiences of love creating faith. Yeah. Yeah, so there is at least a kind of ambiguity there that I think is worth pointing out. It's it's a struggle. (laughs) It is. It is. I don't know if that, I don't know if I fully got there, Pat. Yeah, I think, you know, then you can say faith is victory. You know, you're still building on that faith, but the love, the dying of Christ, the dying of Christ, all that just really enhances our faith and makes it richer and deeper and then we're more willing to to express that love but you know all I'm saying is it just seems like mm-hmm. unwittingly maybe perhaps he almost seems to take it by that statement uh, love produces or creates yeah. or seems to take it off the foundation of faith maybe it means <laughs> I'm going to need some help here. (laughs) Maybe we could phrase it, love creates more faith. Would that help? It sort of takes the beginning that's already there. That's the root is faith. But living in love maximizes that. So it's saying enhances. I think you're on the right track, then. Thank you. Well, I may be wrong. <laughs> Pat, you're leading next week. <laughs> <laughs> we talked last week about the concept of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we talked about if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, what's the completion of it? Love. Love is the completion of wisdom because we're when, when love is engaged, we're no longer, you know, obedience is not drudgery. Uh, uh, obedience is not so much obligatory as it is our greatest pleasure. So I do think there's a sense in which, which love, I mean. <laughs> well, I, I think when, he's, when he says love creates faith, it's dependent on the previous sentence. Love, her love deepened her faith, which her faith is already there, but her love, like you said, creates more faith. Mm-hmm. It's not de novo, like from zero. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Pat. Peace. 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 I ask somebody to read that. When Luther looked inward. When Luther looked inward at his own obedience, he kept finding more and more sin. His flesh, like ours, was bottomless. Overcome with self-preoccupation, he realized we are bent in and curved in upon ourselves. In effect, Luther tried to do the J-curve without the foundation of justification by faith. That's why justification by faith was so liberating for him. Among other things, he realized he didn't need to confess every sin in order for it to be forgiven. Think about the ways you've grown as a Christian over the years. Have you ever had seasons when the Lord pulled back the curtain to reveal sin dwelling in you? 
you had never seen before, but had been there all along. If awareness and confession of sin in sum total were a requirement for justification, where would that leave us? <laughs> Have you ever been undone in seasons when the Lord pulls back the curtain of dab, and you're looking at your own heart, and you're thinking, that's been here all along. And I've never seen it. And if your doctrine of the justification of justification by faith is, is, well, it's only, I'm only justified if I'm aware of all my sin, have confessed it, it's placed before the Lord. I mean, have you ever had anybody ask you the question, well, what if, what if you sin in a really big way? And before you became aware of it, or before you confessed it, you got run over by a, you know, a bus. Or is that, it leaves us in a really abysmal thought place. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about the fact that the Lord knows how you're going to sin next week? It's not... It's not the fact, at least it, it's this way for me, it's not the fact that God forgave me for the things I did last week that so amazes me. That's amazing in and of itself. It's the fact he has already seen what I'm going to do next week and next month and next year. And he said, I paid for that too. I mean, think about it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, it is finished all of our sin in this room was still in the future. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's an amazing aspect of our justification. I want you to stare at the last two, uh, two sentences there of, of that. In effect, Luther tried to do the J-curve without the foundation of justification by faith. That's why justification by faith was so liberating for him. Among other things, he realized he didn't need to confess every sin in order for it to be forgiven. If what Paul Miller says is true here, how does it expand the ways we often think about the forgiveness we've received? I mean, that's an expansive thought. Huh? It's important to remember that uh, it's not just that individual sins are forgiven, but persons are forgiven. So when I'm saved, the person of Tyler is saved. And I'm either totally saved or I'm totally unsaved. There's no, you know, wait till baptismal regeneration on my deathbed, hope I covered most of it, maybe I'll sin afterwards. It's, it's all or nothing. And in Christ, it's all. And what that ought to do is drive us to confess and root out everything that we can, knowing it's not like there's a ledger where these sins are covered and these have yet to be confessed, but my person is united to Christ in his death and resurrection, not only in the union with Christ in Jacob living, but the, the foundational justification that occurred. So it's persons, not sins. Yeah, sins are bundled up into persons, but that, that's helpful for me. Yeah. Think about when, so a person comes to faith as an adult. They're becoming conscious of sins, like individual offenses. So you can, you can, you can picture a new believer all excited about this new faith and growing and filled with the Holy Spirit and overwhelmed and excited. But they're still grieved by their sin. And a person like that, you can envision a new Christian, an adult Christian, kind of going through life and saying, well, I, well, I I probably messed up about 15 times today. And they could name those things. And then as we grow in the Lord, we become aware, of, oh, I, it's not just that I sin, individual sins, I have a sin nature. It's an identity. It's a DNA. It's systemic. This sin is not just individual things I do or don't do. It's systemic. It's, I, I liked what you said. Tyler's forgiven. Tyler's justified. It's, this is a, a thing about identity. Who I am. So this is an expansive statement, I think, here. 
he didn't need to confess every sin in order for it to be forgiven. I mean, that's expansive. Um, Cover that. Let's jump over to page 73. Uh, I'm picking up there, uh, third the way down, where it says she made she made the common error. See that? She made the it's talking about Mother Teresa. She made the common error of looking at her faith and not at the finished work of Christ. When we look at our faith, we inevitably look at our feelings. And if you ground God's love for you in your feelings, neither your conscience nor heart will be satisfied. In effect, Mother Teresa embraced justification by sensing God's love for her. When we base God's love for us on how we feel about his love, it inevitably leads to self-entanglement because we never have enough faith. Can you relate? Can you relate? Do you ever wonder, is my faith genuine? Do I really believe? Is my faith strong enough? To what extent do you all struggle with that? Is that, is that a real, I mean, is, I would say it is for me, for sure. Can you relate to that, what, what she's dealing with here? I know you're never supposed to ask yes or no questions in a classroom, but Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about it. So she's trying to start with the chin curve and go from there. Am I right? Started? At this point, at this point in her life, anyway, she's she not got justification by faith down path as her foundation. She's now trying to still on the same curve of in and of itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just loving without, you know, having that faith. Mm-hmm. Right. That must come first. Right. Matt. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, without being overly um, cold-headed, you know, she says, I call. Um, so scripture says, when I call, he will answer. She says, I want. Scripture says, I shall not want. Um, you know, I'm alone. You are not alone. Scripture says, I'm not alone. So the word says, not true. Her heart says this stuff, but the word says no. So, if I can think the word instead of my own thoughts, then I can I can answer that. Thank you, Priscilla. Mm -hmm. I, I I think often, and we we don't we don't talk a lot at Rick Lane, you know, some other you know, in some places theologically, in some churches, you'll find that there are you know there's a there's a demon behind every shrub, right? We don't we don't talk a lot about the influence and the work of the evil one. But he's active here. He's active here. Yeah. The, I, I appreciate that very much because I was, as I was looking at this too, and but you picked up on it far better than I did, Priscilla. Can you recognize the lies of the evil one in this? He's not going to forgive you again. Your faith is so weak. Do you really belong to him? He's busy. And he's really good at what he does. But Priscilla's right on. I feel alone. Yeah, but you're not. Can I say, it, it does seem to me important to recognize, though, I, I think that the feeling alone is a real feeling. Yeah. 
So it's not as though feeling alone is a sin. Again, you pointed us to David, mm -hmm. who very frequently talks this way. Mm -hmm. You write all over the Psalms. You've got expressions that say, why have you left me alone? Or Jesus saying, why have you forsaken me? Right? Was he forsaken? Well, right, there's all sorts of difficult questions there. You know. So it, it seems important for me to be able to say, I do feel alone. And it's not like God is saying, stop feeling that way. He's saying instead, you're not. The feeling is there. You're not alone. And that's a tricky balance to maintain, I think. It is a tricky balance. So what's the, like the what, what, what's the next step on the back side of that? Mm. I feel alone. Mm. You're not alone. Mm. You're not wrong to feel that way. Mm -hmm. But what do I do mm -hmm. when I'm there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's it's going to be God's word says I'm not alone. Yeah. He has told yeah, Tom. If you like look back on your life and it's like a typical point in your life and you feel alone and you ask God, God, where were you in that time? He, I think he'll respond that I was always there. He just, you know, didn't see me in that. And there's a verse in the Bible, I think it's in Corinthians, um, and it says, be still and know that I'm God. So you just need to slow down and just know that he is God and he is who he says he is. It's one of my favorite verses. So I'm going to share. I think in a sense, feeling not alone is a gift. Because living in a sinful world is always pushing us towards feeling alone because of the way the world is. I'm sorry, say again the beginning. Feeling not alone? Not is feeling a gift. alone. Not is a feeling gift. alone is a gift. Uh -huh. Because we live in a world which is always telling us we are alone in many different ways. So, we're going to go with that. So, you know, we talk about the 16 inches between the head and the heart, which is getting back to what you said, Steve. You know, in our minds, we know we're not alone because the Bible says so. But that doesn't generate feeling. It generates a fact that we can rest on. So the feeling that should come from God's Word is a gift from Him that He gives us. It's not natural. Yeah. I think we think it should be natural, but it's not. It's not. Yeah. In the end, it's not. Don't? Yeah, it, uh, yeah speaking of, uh, uh, metaphorically, look, we've all gone into a heated swimming pool, and we get to a point where we feel nothing. But that does not negate the fact that there's a swimming pool all around us, compared to when we go into a, an ice-cold lake. Then we know it's there, you know, we, we have, because there's, there's such a, um, a divide, you know, between our alignment with, you know, temperature-wise, with the uh, the heated swimming pool, I'm talking about what it be with God as opposed to being off at a distance from Him as well. So I, I kind of hear that theme from a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. Priscilla, you had a comment. Uh, yeah, two comments. I. Um Sometimes I, I, I've said to Wendell, I said, I sometimes feel like I'm living in a fantasy world hmm. because my circumstances tell me one thing and I keep pounding away. It's not true, it's not true, it's not true. What is true is what God says, not what I think, what I feel. And um, there, I don't know, there's a silly little, well, it's not silly. There was a story called The Little Princess about this girl who, I don't know if anybody, it's a child story, but. She actually was a princess, but she got transported to England to put in an orphanage and they threw, put her up in the attic. And she kept pretending she was a princess. And lo and behold, she actually was. And I thought, to me, that's kind of like an analogy of, mm -hmm. of I actually am a princess, even though I'm living in the attic of an orphanage and, you know, they're mm -hmm. cutting my food off. And the other thing is that, you know, I have learned, um, Sometimes I, I feel like a, I weigh a hundred, you know, I got a hundred pound weight on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Circumstances, something happened, I saw someone, you know, um, and I, I, I go out and I'm like, you know, I'm trying to say what's true, what's true, what's true, you know. And I've come to just say, you know what, this is going to go away. This hundred pound is going to evaporate in about three days and I don't know why, right. but it's, and then I know that once it evaporates, it's going to come back. So I don't know. That's just my experience. 
One of the when I owned a business, when when Cindy and I were in business doing landscaping and construction and so forth, almost without fail, I would wake up every Monday morning, and I would I would feel I would feel that weight. And it was, I'm looking out in front of me at the week that I have in front of me, and I'm thinking about all the things I need to get done by the end of the week. One of the things I would often pray on Monday was, Lord, from Monday's perspective, this week look, looks absolutely unattainable. Like one guy cannot get all this done. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Can you cause the things that you think are important to stay on radar, would you cause the things that you know already are not important to fall off into forgetfulness? And it was amazing by the time I got to Friday how often I would look back at Monday and, and look at my list. That wasn't important. That wasn't important. That wasn't important. And, I, and it built my faith because I'm saying, well, God is really present here. He's working. Have your experience with the Aper? You ask the hardest questions, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can mute him. <laughs> <laughs> I can mute him. Sorry. Not, no, I appreciate it. I'm just glad there's people in this room smarter than I am. <laughs> well, not me. I don't know about that. If you were describing and Priscilla describing, you know, we're in that valley because he brings us out. That's the victory. You know. That's a resurrection right. side. That, yeah. That's a resurrection side of the J curve. Yes, Pat. Yeah. Right. Amen. Okay. I'm going to sign off. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't you sign off. Don't you sign off. <laughs> well, we know we, we need to have and express faith, but how do we know our salvation is not based upon having exquisitely perfect faith? How is focusing on Christ's finished work an expression of beautiful faith, and was it, what does it produce in us? Okay, so here we're talking about the quality of our faith, or the perfection of our faith, because like Mother Teresa, I think we can struggle with, is my faith genuine? Is it real? Is it, is it saving faith? Um, so let's talk about that. How, how is focusing on Christ's finished work an expression of beautiful faith, and what does it produce in us? The adverb in the phrase justification by faith is of course significant in that it's not our faith that saves us, it's Christ that saves us. And that if we're looking at our faith, trying to wonder whether it's strong enough, the answer is no, your faith is not strong enough to save you, your faith never saves you don't look to faith, look to Christ and looking to Christ is looking in faith and sometimes we get morbid and introspective and that's never healthy that's what, I'm sorry, that's never healthy and paradoxically when we're looking to Christ, not to our faith our faith grows we're actually expressing faith when that happens right. yeah it's, that's actually the expression of faith. Dave? Yeah, I mean, he, he articulates exactly that, and I love how he says it. Looking at your what, faith... What, what page are you on? This is the bottom of 73, the last paragraph. Looking at your faith will depress you, whereas exercising faith by looking to Jesus frees you. We are declared righteous because of Jesus' blood, not by the energy of our faith. Yeah, like, so well said. Yeah, both of these. Absolutely. I, I think I, it's, it's a very subtle kind of issue, you know. Can I say that sometimes in our, in our church, you know, when we are doing a baptism or something like that or a profession of faith, one of the questions that we ask of candidates there is, so are you trusting in anything else but Jesus, even a little bit? And I always want to say, well... There are all kinds of ways in which I trust in all kinds of things. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So in a certain sense, I, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world in a way. I suppose it's the most natural thing to, for my faith to miss the right object. You know, um, mm -hmm. Maybe we even ought to expect that I miss the right object. I have faith that God will overlook the weakness in my faith in a way, right? 
that's got to be part of the gospel, or the, the gospel doesn't get us very far. It doesn't. Yeah. Right. Right. Steve, I wonder. I'm sorry. No, oh, please. I wonder if that goes back to what I was saying about persons being saved. It's not as yeah. though your state of justification teeters right. depending yeah. on whether you're trusting wholly in Christ or wholly in Christ plus something. If you're saved or you're not, and if you are, then your Christ plus something will be forgiven as well mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. it needs to be. Mm-hmm. I don't want to miss the last part of this question, uh, which is, what does it produce in us? So, for actually living that way, first of all, how do you know you're living that way? And by that way, I mean we're actually living by faith. We're, we're staring at Jesus and finished work on the cross instead of the quality of our faith. What does it actually produce? And by being justified, we have Christ's righteousness that is that covers us that makes us then ambassadors however imperfect because we're still walking in a sinful world and in living for Christ we really have two options one is to live obedience or in an attitude of obedience or in an attitude of repentance and I think I, I, just want to, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I just want to give you an example. It happened the other day. It, it explains what I'm talking about. Um, we're, we're cleaning an apartment where there have been dozens of families in and out, you know, and cleaning up. It's part of the church. The women were involved, I was involved. And I came across a little mineral, iron pyrite. It was in a closet. And it looks like, it actually looks like gold, okay? And I'm interested in minerals and that sort of thing. And, and there it was. And I thought, you know, somebody left this behind, you know. Somebody else is coming in, you know. But I thought, no, that's stealing. And the alternative would have been, if I had taken it, then I would have had to go in the direction of the J-curve, where I'd have to go back to the owner and, and say, you know, and... and Empty myself out, you know, get down and say, I'm so sorry, I took this. I mean, he wouldn't have cared, you know, it was just, <clears throat> just a rock, most people. <laughs> but I think but I think that's the, the part of the, the appeal that Jake curved for me is, I don't want to go through it. Mm-hmm. Okay? And as, and having recently have, as a person having Christ's righteousness, you're going to be going to an attitude of repentance in order to restore, not in order to gain favor, but in order to, to preserve that that mantle of Christ's righteousness before the world. And I, I, I would try to live in obedience first, however imperfectly, but if I fall into that, I know that there is a way where I can be restored without having lost faith that, 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 I, that I'm safe. Mm-hmm. That's why it's so lengthy there, but that's... Yeah. Uh, that yeah, I, did, I did not take the, the mineral, by the way. I, I left it in the corner of the closet. <laughs> Which house is this? For somebody else. <laughs> I'll take it. It really does come back to obedience, right? We live in obedience to what we know. We start moving in the right direction based upon upon what God's word says. Right? So, I'm not alone. What does that mean? means I can actually live like someone who is loved by the Lord. It means I can stop responding to fear and start moving with confidence. When you start, you start answering the question, what does it produce in us? This is the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And certainly obedience, as, as Doug has well said. Living in obedience to what we know. But it's also producing in us love. Joy, for heaven's sake. Joy. If I actually believe I'm forgiven, that I'm in Christ, that his righteousness is surrounding me and and on me, and it's right here, I can actually start living like a forgiven person, which means I'm full of joy. I lay my head on the pillow at night and I fall asleep because I'm not constantly running the tape of how horrible I am. I actually live there. I'm going to take God at his word and I'm going to say, 
I actually believe you forgive me completely, even for the stuff I'm going to do next week. And I'm going to run around in that grace like I'm a little kid that just got turned out on the playground. I'm going to run around in grace because I'm so securely held in the arms of my Father. That's what it actually looks like to believe. You actually have the capacity to experience joy and peace. That's what it produces. That's what it produces. Um, look at page 73, paragraph beginning with, because they also lack the grounding, down toward the bottom. Because they also lacked the grounding and justification by faith, they gave a good cure. The J-curve, okay, the J-curve is a good cure. But to the wrong disease is sensitive conscience. If her, had, if her disease had been failure to live out the gospel in love for others, the J-curve would have been the right cure. But for her condition, a conscience looking to its own ability to feel God's love, the real curve, it's justification by faith. Isn't that good? Isn't Mother Teresa does not need a more sensitive conscience. She needed to know she was forgiven. Let's look up a couple passages here. Now somebody grab, because I want to ask the question, what's the message that Mother Teresa actually needed to hear? And if we were in a worship service, this is the part of the worship service where we, we talk about... Um, Assurance of pardon. Can I get somebody to get Luke 18, 9 through 14? Who would get that? I don't know. Thank you, Doug. Isaiah 57, 15. Got it. Got it. Can you get that for me, please? Matthew 5, 3 and 4. Jason. John 21, 7. Can I get Brittany to talk a little bit? Sure. Okay. John 21, 7, please. In that order, then. Luke 18, 9 to 14. 9 to 14, okay. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I don't know how many times I've come back to that passage when I'm struggling with the stuff that we've been reading about today, especially for, for me it would be Mother Teresa. I, I, I would put myself pretty heartily in her camp in terms of wondering, is, is my faith really genuine? Is my faith strong enough? When I'm looking too much at my faith and I'm not looking at Christ, boy, have I come back to that passage so many times. Because I'm asking the question, what is actually precious to our Savior? Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. I don't see righteousness in here. I see sin in here, and I so want to be different. I'm so grieved over who I am and the kinds of things that I do and the kinds of things that I say and the kind of things that I think. We have our Savior's word there. That man goes home justified. And I find myself saying, Matt, are you weeping over your sin? Yeah, actually I am. Okay then. That's the heart I'm after. Look at me. Get your eyes off you. Look at me. Who's got... Can I just go back? I, I, so I, I think this is exactly right. But as soon as I say, all right, am I weeping over my sin? In a certain sense, I'm, I'm right on the edge of real danger there, right? Yeah. Because again, I'm looking back at me. Am I enough like the penitent tax collector in the temple? Am I really repenting? And the answer there surely is, 
it comes and goes. Yeah. So it's, I can't even look at my own <laughs> repentance in order to say, ah, now I'm, the whole point is to stop looking at me and to hear instead the promise of Christ. Yeah. Right? So I, I, I just think it's... Because you have to move forward. You've got to move forward exactly. from that moment. Because when, you get, exactly. you get, when you're that kid that gets turned out on the playground... Well, I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking about my sin anymore. Hmm. Now I'm running around and having a good time. I'm running around in that grace. Right. In that moment, I'm not like. That's right. The That's right. And, you know, and I'm, in not, a certain, I'm not beating my breast. In a certain sense, it may have been Mother Teresa's way of being on the playground was to go and minister to somebody that had other kinds of hurts. She's no think, no longer thinking about her own doubts. Yeah. She's thinking about this person's uh -huh. suffering. And that's a that may be a, a pathway that works that really does allow you to see Christ better as a result. I think. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder if the anal uh, uh, this analogy is helpful. Um, sometimes, uh, well, years ago, I, 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 I had seen um, people on social media. A, a girl who's recently engaged and and then married to to a guy, publicizing her love for that guy on social media, but the focus was on her her love instead of. On that guy, so um, if she if she was really focused on that guy, the love would just come naturally. But instead, it seemed to be that um, if she was focused on that expression itself, and uh, I don't know if that that's a similar kind of situation we were talking about. Is my repentance enough? It seemed in there there is like is my love enough? And it's just the wrong focus. It will it will come naturally if we're focused on the right thing. Yeah. It seems like timing is an issue. Like, you can't sit there so long that you are in absolute despondency. But you have to sit there long enough to feel that that grief and go on. You know? Mm -hmm. You can't just skip over it like a stone, right. you know, skipping over a lake. Yeah. But you have to, it's it's kind of this thing. You, you need to be there in a healthy amount of, of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Might I say time. It's a healthy amount of space that you're dwelling on that and then going on. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we'll get into that scenario of skipping over it in the next chapter. Right, right ahead. <laughs> He's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually have not read the next chapter, but I looked at the the like the, the title and I went, Oh yeah, okay. We might get there. I see where he's going. Okay. Anyway, sorry. I, yeah, I don't know if it would be helpful to, if you know, I talked about earlier when I was really struggling yeah. with being alone. Uh, as we're talking, I'm realizing I was actually going through a day curve right mm -hmm. there. Um, mm -hmm. Before that happened, it was it was a few weeks before Christmas, my first Christmas without Jimmy, and I knew that um, that you know I'm going to have to go through this mm -hmm. and. Um, but what was really neat, I was like, I need to acknowledge it. I can't just pretend it's not there. But I, I don't want to get just completely derailed by it. Um, and through a friend who gave me a really good insight, I decided that I would pray that Jesus would show me something more precious about himself. Mm -hmm that Christmas than I'd ever seen before. And I kind of thought, oh, I'll probably be something that's really uplifting, no. whatever. Mm. And I played that like a Thursday night. And this was Friday night that I'm laying in bed and when I, I'm crying, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm really focused on the fact that of my loss mm. and, and thinking and, and, you know, kind of thinking, you know, God understands all of your loss, but I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, but Jesus, you were never married. You don't know what this is like, you know. But in that crying out and saying, I can't do this myself. You have to help me. And what was amazing was God well, started getting me thinking about that first Christmas. And Think about how, I mean, the things that I kind of like about Christmas, all the traditions and stuff that we like, none of that stuff was there. And, you know, I think it's giving that, well, 
you know, cookies or, you know, whatever. And I started thinking about what Jesus did, what, what he lost. What was his loss? That he left heaven and came to earth as a vulnerable baby. And just all the, all the loss that he had. And, you know, he still had a relationship with his father, but I, I don't know that it was quite completely the same as it was when he was in I mean, I don't even think about what kind of glory he had mm-hmm. in heaven. And he, and he gave that up. He gave it up willingly. And, I mean, the loss, and the loss, he was, you know, he was forsaken. And it just, I don't it just filled me. It gave me something that was gone. And I practiced it. Yes, he does understand. <laughs> and his loss is greater, much greater than mine. And honestly, I mean, it carried me through that season amazingly. And, oh, uh, you know, like I said, he was very gracious to me because it was a pretty short chamber. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I had to. He allowed me to go down into that, you know, hard place and didn't just, you know, took me through it. Isn't it amazing that there is no, there's no J curve that we can enter. There literally is no J curve that we can enter where Jesus has not already been and a thousand times deeper. And when, when, we, when we start to recognize that he's in, we, we're being united with him in his suffering. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, it, that, that changes the whole game. Well, that's what was amazing to me. It really did take yeah. my eyes off of the responsibility of all for myself at that point. Yeah. That it was a resurrection because I'm thinking about what Jesus did. Mm-hmm. And just being amazed. When we were, when we were doing the series... Uh, uh, the stunning Savior here a couple terms ago in the sanctuary. Uh, we were talking about that principle that there's there's none of us that can look at the Lord and say, "You don't know how I feel." Hmm. You can't actually say that and have it be true. You never can. Ken Paris came to me after that class and he said, "Matt, I was having a conversation with somebody, and um, I was trying to explain that idea that." He has tasted all of our suffering, all of our pain. And the person said, what about someone who has been sexually abused or sold into sexual slavery? Like, can we actually say that Jesus has tasted that depth of pain? Well, think about that. You know, as far as we know, you know, that precise thing never happened to Christ. What did happen to him? Book of John says that when the soldiers divided his clothing, there were four garments. There must have been four soldiers. There's four garments. They divide out the four garments. And then um, there's one left over, and it clearly says it's sewn together as one piece with the undergarment. Which tells you that when Jesus is crucified, I mean, he's naked. Let that sink down a little bit. He's naked, and he's surrounded by Roman soldiers. What do you? What kind of comments do you think are going on? You can fill in the blank pretty easily. And he's hung up on. I mean, it's pornographic, right? He's up in front of a large crowd, and he's he's naked. I mean, he, he's tasting sexual abuse, exploitation in that moment. The, to say nothing about what he experienced in hell with, his, with, with the, the wrath of God every sin was poured out on him that we know of or can imagine without getting specific that, that's what I imagine that, that, that he endured I, and I can't imagine right. beyond any any single earthly or combination of earthly Sins that anyone it was all for that. He actually became sin for us. Son. He became I mean his identity, he becomes sin for us. He takes on that identity. 
We need to close. I'm four minutes over. Uh, we didn't get through the end, but that is good. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that there is no suffering we can experience where you've not been there in that valley a thousand times deeper than we ever have. And so we're, we are united with you in your suffering, and we're so grateful for that because it adds it adds purpose and meaning to the difficult things we experience in life. We thank you, Lord, that our salvation, our justification, is not contingent upon having a faith that's perfected, that's zealous, and fervent all the time, or we're weak. It's not even based on, upon our, like Steve was saying earlier, our ability to shed tears well over our sin. Uh, teach us what it means to look at you and your finished work day by day when doubts creep in, and to rest on that. And then to help us, Lord, to live in obedience to you and run around in grace. What a beautiful picture it is and what, what opportunity you lay before us to do that. Lord, teach us what these things mean. And now as we go to worship, would you be greatly glorified in the service today? We want to worship for an audience of one. We pray that you would receive it, be pleased, and that it would give you joy to hear your children gathered together in your name.